Welcome to Maple City Baptist Church this morning. If you're not tuned in yet, it's 91.5. Thank you for being here. We have a number of guests and visitors with us this morning as well. We're delighted that you've joined us, some for the very first time. Thank you again. And thanks to all the volunteers who make this work, from the parking lot to the greeters. Thank you so much for everything. Uh, just a service announcement. Washrooms are open. That door there, this door here in the back of the building. So feel free to use it whenever you need to. And uh, let's just get into it this morning. Lots happening today. Uh, just so that you know, um, we had a number of calls last week about our parking lot. And just to set you at ease, under these draconian measures, we are doing perfectly what the uh, requirement demands of us. And so we're, we're doing it perfectly legally. All right. And so just be aware of that. But they said that they thought there were 50 cars in our parking lot. And uh, it's just not right. There were over 100. So, yes. Um, so, uh, with that said, many of, thank you. Many of you received a petition this morning. And the petition just talks about what we've already known for the last 14 months that church and gathering is essential. This is proof of that this morning. And I have signed that statement just to make a statement that this is exactly what we believe. If you want to do that as well, sign it. We'll pick it up on the way out of the parking lot. So it's in your hands now. Let me just read for you a card from Carolyn and Sherry. Dear Pastor Rick, Pastor Dan, and our whole MCBC family, how thankful I am to my Lord Jesus for his grace in sharing um, with me such a wonderful church family right here in Chatham the beautiful fruit basket you sent this past week in memory of our sweet sister Susan who left us last Tuesday for the courts of glory touched us Susan is now home at last never to suffer again she finished her course um, here victoriously after eight long years of ALS it must have seemed like nothing when she fell into her Savior's arms we will miss Susan dearly, but it won't be long until we see her again. Thank you for sending uh, us such a loving remembrance. Love, Carolyn and Sherry. So Carolyn's here this morning. Continue to pray for her family, if you would. And then congratulations for our church family that, that know Andrew and Stacy. Uh, Stacy gave birth to a baby boy on Thursday. Anderson Rees McComb was born. So we thank God for that this morning. And then... Yeah, one person clapped. I think it was the uncle. Yeah. All right, much, much better. There you go. And then this Friday, uh, Trevor Burton celebrated one year sobriety. So God bless you, Trevor. And lots of great events today. I know there's some birthdays. I know Brother Tom's birthday is this morning. Um, and so happy birthday, Tom. Uh, yeah, that's good. That was his son. Um, and then this morning, Paul and Debbie Van Kasteren are celebrating 40 years of marriage. So God bless you guys. Okay. Yes, our neighbors know we're here today now. Okay. So um, there are prayer opportunities again this week. Tuesday at 7 o'clock is our Zoom meeting. Uh, Jeff Marling takes care of that. You can pop in, pop out from about 7 to 8. You just have to e email him if you need more information. Just let us know. Thursday morning at 9.30 and then Friday at 11 for our Mary and Martha group. Take advantage of that. And then continue to pray uh, for Brother Jack. And Dallin um, uh, was in for double pneumonia and now he's got some blood clots. They're being treated. He seems like he's recovering, but continue to pray for him. And then pray for Michelle Peters. I saw Travis here this morning, which I'm assuming that Michelle still hasn't had the baby. So pray for Michelle and Travis if you would. And then this note from Shirley Maynard this morning, she'd asked if we'd pray for her husband, Rick, um, just diagnosed with a, a form of dementia. And so pray for Rick and Shirley, if you would. And so we come together this morning um, to worship our Lord and Savior. And let me encourage you, uh, there are a lot of distractions in the car sometimes with what we have, with our kids and all around us. 
But let's try to stay focused this morning as we sing the praises of our Lord and Savior, as we hear the preaching of the Word of God, um, intentionally tune in to what's happening. Let me read for you our text, a text this morning that we'll refer back to in just a few moments. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives a prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. They, they exercise self-control. Now they do it to obtain a crown, a, a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty or aimlessly, so fight I not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning, and then we'll corporately sing together. Father, I thank you for the beauty of this day. Thank you for your kindness. Since we've been outside, you've held back the rain. You've given us good weather, and we acknowledge and rejoice in that. And Lord, now as we've gathered together in this parking lot, as the public witness of our thoughts towards you and your body, I pray that you protect this gathering. I pray that your spirit would work in power, even in the midst of our vehicles and by way of online services, that you'd speak through the preaching of your word. And now, Lord, through the singing, gear and direct our thoughts toward Jesus. May he, through the singing and the preaching of the word, be glorified. It's in his name we ask. Amen. Go ahead, join us in singing, Hallelujah, What a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came through and sinners to reclaim, Hallelujah. What a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior, guilty, vile, helpless, weak, Spotless Lamb of God was He, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was He to die, it is finished was His cry, now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. When He comes, our glorious King, all His ransomed home to bring, now in whom a song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, forever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me then depart. No tongue can bid me then depart. When Satan tempts me to despair 
and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself, I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God. Thank you men for the good singing. Thank you church for being here this morning you have your Bibles with you, join me in turning to Hebrews chapter 12, where we'll begin this morning and end Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. The writer of Hebrews says, wherefore, and as soon as we come to that statement, wherefore or therefore, it's a reminder for us just to stop and once again remember what he just said. And if you recall, we just finished Hebrews chapter 11, where we were given a list of heroes and heroines who, named and unnamed, followed the Lord and were commended by God for their faith. We have a list of people who took hold of the Word of God in such a way that they built their lives upon it and it completely changed them. You see, faith, uh, belief, and obedience are the, same, uh, are the two sides of the same coin. So when we say we have faith, the natural thing to do that is to act upon it, and that's exactly what we've seen. And so we have this list of individuals who practiced great faith and that they were obedient. And yet, at the very end of that chapter, the writer tells us, that they did not receive the promise. That in their lifetime, acting in obedience, acting in faith, when it was all said and done, there was something not done. There was something unleft that should have been accomplished. They were looking for the promise. And we, on the other side of the cross, have had the opportunity to see exactly what that was. Because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus Christ stepped into our world. The promise that they were looking at, the one who would be the Savior, who would establish a new covenant in his blood, who would give himself, who would make reconciliation between sinful mankind and the Father, who would die, be buried, and rise again on the third day to show his justification over our sins, his power over death and the grave. And this is what we have today. And so the writer reminds us that for these individuals in chapter 11, they endured, but they did not experience what we experience today. And if we look at their lives, it means that for you and I, we have no excuse not to endure in the race before us. And now the writer, after reminding us, paints a beautiful picture. He says this, 
Seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is before us. It's amazing what he does here. He paints this, this beautiful picture. And he says, for you and I, that there is a cloud, or in the Greek, the idea of a host or a company of people. And he paints a picture of a, of a stadium, an Olympic stadium, where you, you would find the games being played, the race being run. And he says that we, as God's people now, are surrounded by this great cloud, this great host of men and women who have gone before us in the stadium. They are previous champions. They have finished their course. They have run the race. They have passed the baton onto us. They have showed us by their example what it looks like to take the word of God, to believe it, and to act upon it. Some had great fear, but acted. Others had little faith, but acted. Still others lost their lives knowing what was to come and acted. And here they are as witnesses cheering us on, not only showing us the example, but shouting us to victory. Shouting every believer in Christ to run the race, to finish the race that's set before you. This text is, is possibly the most beautiful text in Hebrews. And, and as I was looking at the text this week, I had real struggles with it. Because as I thought about the temperature and the climate of North American Christianity, I wonder sometimes in our own life if we're even aware that we're in a race and we're running a race. If you've had small children who have played in junior uh, soccer leagues, um, they're always great to watch. But almost every time as you watch eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds play, there's a group of kids following the ball from one point to the next. And there's always that one kid who is sitting in the middle of the field playing with dandelions. Maybe that was your kid. And they seem to be oblivious to anything that's going on around them. Now, some of you think that's cute. I think it's a shame. I think we're made to compete. We keep score for a reason, right? That there are lessons to learn in teamwork and even losing. But this kid is just buying his or her time until the freezies are available at halftime or the cupcakes come later. And oftentimes I feel in our own environment that many of us as believers are sitting on the field playing with dandelions and unaware that each and every one of us this morning is in a race. And it's a real race. And if you're a follower of Christ, whether you like it or not, you're in it today. And I think this is where Paul helps us to remind us of the race, of the fact that we don't just get a participation award. It's a race to be won. Back in 1 Corinthians 9, the text that I started with, Paul helps us there. But before we even get to that text, I want you to understand something. Before he talks about this race that we're all involved in, he says this, I have become all things for all men that I might win some. And Paul said, everything I do is for the sake of the gospel. Everything. Paul so crafted his life that every thought he had and everything he did and every interaction in his life was geared toward, he says later, that I might share with all of these people the blessing. And what's the blessing? The blessing is the gospel. And I don't even know if we comprehend when we say that the gospel is the greatest blessing we can share with anyone. The gospel comes in a world that is broken. And if you doubt that, turn on the news. I am always mortified as I just scroll down story after story that's unimaginable what humans do to humans in our world today. The world is broken, the world has fallen, the world is sinful. And be careful. 
We separate ourselves from that, but we're part of the problem. In our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own selfishness and greed, we're part of the problem. We are sinners by nature and sinners by choice. And God could have destroyed and rightly judged all of this. And yet the gospel comes and says it's good news. And it's good news because he stepped into our world. He lived the life we could not. He died upon the tree, was buried, and rose again for us. And the gospel is good news. It is a blessing because it talks of hope. It talks of redemption. It speaks of eternal life, not just in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty here and now. It is our hope this morning that you and I do not have to be what we used to be. The guilt, the shame, the selfishness, the hatred, the unforgiveness, the lust, the anger, the greed, all of it can be changed by the gospel. And Paul knows that you and I, as believers this morning who know Christ, we, as Luther said, must tell ourselves the gospel every day because we forget the gospel every day. But it is our hope. And with that said now, Paul tells us this. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. And so he makes it clear this morning that the race is being run. And all of us this morning, we are runners in that race. We're not designed to sit on the sideline. We're not designed to play with dandelions. We're designed to run the race before us. And when he says, one wins the prize, it doesn't mean that the 300 people outside fail. It means that every last individual has the opportunity this morning to run your race and to obtain the prize. He goes on to say this, and every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. And he's painting that picture of the Olympic Games where the runner is in the stadium and they were striving. They had exercised themselves. They had controlled themselves. And they do this to receive a reward, a crown, a wreath that was perishable. He says, that's what we're doing. We're running this race. I found an amazing quote this week by the Olympian uh, Usain Bolt, Jamaican sprinter, gold medalist. And here's what he said, and it, it just lines up perfectly with what Paul is talking about. He said, I trained for four years. Now let that sink in for a minute. I trained for four years. Disciplined myself. Didn't eat junk. I exercised. I pushed. I struggled. Four years to run for nine seconds. For nine seconds. Four years. And that's exactly what Paul is speaking about. And he says, those athletes do that and sacrifice for a crown, a reef that's perishable. It will fade away. And even for a guy like Bolt who wins a gold medal, when he dies, the medal stays. And if his kids are anything like my kids, they're going to the pawn shop the day after. These kids are not sentimental about anything. Anything. And so he says, there's a race to run. There's a prize to be gained. And our prize is not perishable. It's everlasting. And so he says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not aimlessly, so fight I not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body, I discipline myself, and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be counted a castaway. And so Paul says, believer, listen to me this morning. We are running a race. We're running, each of us are running the race. And so quit playing with dandelions. Quit acting as if it doesn't matter. We're running the race, every last one of us. And as we run this race, quit shadow boxing. Quit being a fearless warrior behind a picket fence and not getting in the ring. Quit wandering aimlessly on the field. Have direction. Look at the prize. Look at where we're headed and where we're supposed to go. Ask God to change our hearts and our lives to give us the desires that matter. And that's what Paul tells us. So back in our text, in light now of knowing 
that every person in this parking lot and every person who's listening, there is a race that you are to run. So the writer of Hebrews says, as we're compassed with all these witnesses cheering us on, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. He says, as we're running this race, lay aside. It means to cease doing what we've been accustomed to doing. Many of us this morning say things like this. Well, I've always said that. I've always done that. Um, I've always been this way. That's just the way that I am. And I'm here to tell you this morning, that's the problem. That's just the way I am. The writer of Hebrews agrees with Paul, it's time to lay those things aside to stop it. And here's what he tells us this morning to lay aside. First, every weight. Weight. And a weight means that which serves to hinder or prevent. This is not necessarily things that are sinful. He'll talk about that in a moment. He says, if we understand that we're running, if we understand that there's a goal and a prize, then as we're running, there are weights in our life. There are things that hinder us or bog us down that we need to cease and get rid of. If you're running a race, you don't pick the heaviest outfit. You don't lay yourself with, with weights. You don't bog yourself down. You run a race. Years ago, when we were in ministry in Michigan, we were in, uh, had a youth group, and every uh, grade 12 class would go on a senior trip. And so we would take them on a senior trip. And back then, we were in a place where the girls wore culottes. If you don't know what culottes are, thank God for it. But culottes are basically ugly men's shorts that are oversized that all the girls had to wear. And so the girls had to wear culottes. I know it's bizarre. Just stay with me on the story. And so Kim was wearing them. The girls were wearing them. We were whitewater rafting in Pennsylvania on a Class 4 river. And as we were whitewater rafting, we hit a, 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 a rapid, and Kim was ejected out of the raft. And it's terrifying. And she was wearing these culottes. Culottes are not designed to, to float. They're actually designed to sink. And she was terrified. And so we got her to the side of the boat. And in that moment, she had a decision to make. Those culottes were dragging her down. They were heavy. But in the process, they raised up to her waist. And so she thought, either I will go to the bottom in these culottes, or I will be rescued and be immodest. And she decided, of course, to be rescued and be immodest, right? Those culottes bogged her down. And the writer of Hebrews says, you're running a race. There are weights in our lives that bog us down in this, in this race. And these are not necessarily sinful things. They can be good things. They can be gifts from God. They can be blessings from Him. But a good thing becomes a bad thing when it keeps me from the best thing. If you and I had a conversation this morning without any pretense, without any idea what was coming, and I said to you, tell me your passion this morning. Without thinking about Sunday school answers, what would you really say your passion was? For many of us, it would be our family. It would be our career. It would be our hobbies, our sports whatever our heart runs after. And again, these are not necessarily bad things. But there are things, if we're running a race and we're serious about being single-minded and finishing the race and receiving the prize, then there are hindrances in our life that must go. Believer this morning, in all of what we've been through in the last 14 plus months, we should understand that as we run this race, we must go back to simplicity. Paul said, this one thing I do. And we should do the same. Lay aside every weight. And then he says, lay aside every sin. That which easily besets, ensnares, or clings so closely. The sin that controls so tightly. This morning as believers... We know the sin in our life. It's ours. It's different for every one of us. But we know that it clings closely. And we know that as we try to live out this life, it hampers us. 
It's, it, it, it doesn't allow us to run the way that God has intended us to run. This sin blinds us. It clings so closely that we make excuses in our lives why our sin is okay and why God overlooks it and why I can still run this race and do it well. We cannot. We're blinded by it this morning. And that's why community is so important. Oftentimes we don't see in our own lives what everybody else is. It's obvious to them. This sin blinds us and this sin ultimately binds us. The sin that holds closely to us promises us peace, comfort, and pleasure. And the truth is, it just enslaves. Look at the world around us. All the promises that sin has made. Take control of your own life. Build your own reality. You can decide what's right and wrong. And look what it's done in our world. But not just at the world out there. Look what it's done to the world in here, in our hearts, in our lives. It leaves carnage. We play and it pounces and destroys. And so the writer of Hebrews says, listen, we're in a race. You're being cheered on, but stop doing what you did. Cease doing what you've been accustomed to. Lay aside your weight and your sin. And then he says, run with patience. The race that is set before you. That word patience is endurance. And I love the beauty and the honesty of Scripture. Paul and the writer of Hebrews here understands that the Christian faith to run this race is not easy. If you jumped into Christianity because someone promised that life would be great and all your wildest dreams would come true, they lied to you. Because in this race, there are disappointments. In this race, there is rejection. In this race, there's suffering and pain. And he says, run with endurance. Run your race set before you. And then he says, looking unto Jesus. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. As you're running, quit looking around, but look to him. Fix. Put your eyes on him. Put your eyes on the finish line. He is the finish line. And I love what he does here. He says, looking to Jesus. He could have said, looking to the Lord, the sovereign king of the universe, looking to God, the one who knows the end from the beginning. But he uses Jesus' human name because the God of heaven identifies with us and he knows and he ran the race and he ran and he endured and now he is the author, the pioneer, the finisher of our faith the perfecter. He has successfully completed and will complete in us and he lived a life on this earth to show us what it looks like to run the race well. And so he says, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ finished his race he endured like we're being asked to endure, to bear up under difficult circumstances. And may I remind you this morning what he endured. It says the cross. And again, in our culture, we're accustomed to the symbol of the cross. But you know that in the first century, it was a symbol of death. It was so horrific and excruciating and shameful that if you were a Roman citizen and you had a capital offense, you would not die this way. You would die by beheading because that was more humane than the cross. And yet Jesus Christ endured the cross. He suffered by human hands. He suffered for our sins, despising the shame and is set before the Father. And look at his attitude during this time. And again, listen, we are talking about the God-man. Jesus Christ was all God, but he was human. He felt, he experienced, he wept, he cried, he was tired, he was hungry. He felt pain and suffering. He agonized. He felt all of these things. He entered into our world. And yet, he faces this cross, he endures on his race. Why? For the joy that was set before him. 
What joy could there be that Christ would endure? And there's lots of thoughts here. Certainly the idea that he would be exalted, that he would please the Father. But, but that has to be the joy of accomplishing salvation for his people. The joy that was set before Jesus Christ this morning to endure what he endured in his race was you and it was me. That's what Christ has done. He endured for us. And so he says, in light of this, we must, verse number three, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. I said it before, I'll say it again. The writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of believers who are tired, who are weary, who are worn. They're discouraged. They're thinking about quitting. They've had enough. They've suffered already. More is coming. Friends are leaving. Folks are not showing up. And what the writer of Hebrews does is he knows this, that their ability to endure and finish the race is in direct proportion to how clearly they see Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on their behalf. And it's the same for us today. My brother and sister in Christ, you are in a race, whether you like it or not. You've got the uniform. You've got the cleats. You've got the shin guards. You are in the race. And you're in it to win it. You are in it to endure. But if we're going to endure this morning, if we're going to endure in our lives, we are great starters, are we not? And we are poor finishers. We start with an excitement and a zeal. And after a little time, we're done. That's not God's plan. Christ endured. Christ with the distance. Christ continues. And we are to do the same. But if we will do that, we must consider him to think, to reason with thoughtfulness. Why? Because if not, if we lose him in our peripheral, and that's what we do. It's not like, after, uh, Jesus, I'm done. No, he's still there, but he's in the peripheral. When we do that, the writer of Hebrews says, consider, lest you weary, you be wearied and grow faint in your minds. He knows that the moment we're in this race and we're tired and weary, we lose motivation, we're discouraged, we lose heart because we have taken our eyes off of Christ. That term there is a sport in sports lingo in the first century. It's about a runner who is exhausted and collapsed. And so he says, listen, you're in a race. Lay aside the weight. Lay aside the sin. Fix your eyes on Christ. Understand he's our example. He endured. Consider him. Not just in passing on Sunday morning, but every day of our lives. I'm concerned this morning in our environment and in my own heart and life that many times we are fans of Jesus Christ. We love the thought of Him. His love, His forgiveness, His compassion. We love the fact that He loved us and died for us. We love the stories we hear. We love to do our Sunday things. But have we become fans instead of followers, instead of disciples of Christ, instead of learners who see Him for who He is and what He's done? And no matter what comes our way, each step we follow Him who endured such contradiction that we endure as well? And believer in Christ this morning, if you know him, I know that in your heart, this is your desire. It's my desire. But it does not happen by wishful thinking. The writer tells us, if that's to be the case, then you and I must turn from our distractions. And we are distracted. We are distracted by our weights. We're distracted by our sin. Tozer understood this. Listen to what he said. This is a prayer of his as he thought about this distraction. He said, Father, I want to know thee, but my cowardly heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding, and I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come 
Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without a rival. Then shalt thou make thy place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it. Thyself will be the light of it, and there shall be no night there. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother and sister in Christ, it is time for all of us to be honest in our race. Are you distracted? What are the toys in our lives that have become so much a part of us that we feel bleeding if we're not to have them? And understand, it is letting those things go that we understand the glory and the beauty of our Christ and we're equipped to finish this race. We must turn from our distraction. Number two, we must turn to Jesus in dedicated concentration. It's not just thinking about him. Oh yes, Jesus. It's seeing his life and what he's done and constantly reminding ourselves of our great captain of our faith. I've been singing this song all week and pray for my wife. I mean, when I sing a song all week, it's like morning, afternoon, evening, while I'm sleeping. Amen, Jeff. You know what I'm talking about. Your wife hates you too. And so, so this is a song, as I thought about being focused on Christ, it's Emmanuel's land. Listen to the words. Oh, Christ, he is the fountain, the deep, sweet well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There too an ocean fullness, his mercy, mercy doth expand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Oh, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's mine. He brings a poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. I stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The bride eyes not her garment. Listen to these words. As you picture a bride on her wedding day, She's not looking at the dress. She's looking at the groom. I've had the privilege of doing lots of weddings. And the most glorious part of the wedding is seeing the bride come in. But my favorite part is watching the groom. It's watching the groom. It's awesome. And here's what the writer says. As we consider Jesus... The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze on glory, but on the king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on the pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. That is the truth. That is our Savior. And my friend, if we're going to finish this race, we must make sure that in our life we turn from our distractions, but we must turn to Jesus with dedicated concentration and know that this is what we are running to. This is the finish line. He is the prize. It's Jesus Christ. Brother and sister, we are in a race. We are in a race to run it well. And the last thing the writer of Hebrews tells us is this. Not only do we turn from our distractions and turn to Jesus with dedicated concentration, but finally, we turn to the reality of our situation. Listen to what he says. You have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And it's amazing. He says, don't grow faint, don't grow weary, don't pass out. Why? Because I want you to understand your situation. You're not dead yet. Your race is not finished. We don't just start. We endure. And we endure to the end. And you understand this. When can you stop? You can stop when you're dead. And by the looks of it, 90% of you are still alive this morning. We finish the race because we have not resisted unto blood. 
We have not been thrown in jail yet. We have not lost our life. And so we run, and we run well. We have a cloud of witnesses. All the saints who have gone before us are shouting, We have finished. We have passed on the baton. Now it's your turn to run your race and to finish well. In that quote by Usain Bolt, he said this, I have trained for four years to run for nine seconds. And there are those who have trained for two months and quit because they don't see results. And I would encourage you, my brother and sister, you've been running for two months, you've been running for two years, you've been running for 20 years, there are results for the believer. There is growth that comes. We, ju we judge our sanctification by what we used to be and how God is changing us. But I don't care if you've been running for 20 or 30 or 40 years, we're still running. And by God's grace, we will finish this race. And we will glorify our Lord. It starts today. It starts today for us. Be honest in your own heart. Our distractions. How many times we, we aren't dedicated in thinking daily about the gospel of Christ and understanding the reality of our situation. Brother and sister in Christ, these are dark days. These are dark times. But the light can be easily seen in these times. And the light will be glorified and magnified as we run and run well, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your word. Lord, forgive us. Many of us have been playing on the field. We've been picking dandelions. We're looking forward to halftime and freezies. And we don't understand. We are to exercise. We are to discipline. We are to run this race. We are to stay in our lane. We are to finish and finish well. And not for our glory, God, but for your glory, to bring honor to our Savior, our Lord and our Captain, Jesus Christ. And so today I pray, if there are those here this morning who are not followers of Christ, not even fans of Christ, they don't know him as Savior, may today be the day that they call upon his name. And for those of us who know him, may we dedicate ourselves once again, rededicate ourselves to the running and the finishing of the race that you set before us looking unto Jesus, considering him. We ask all this in his name. Amen. We'll close this morning with the great song, His Mercy is More. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their son. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience could wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. 
His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood beneath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Sing it out today. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, New every morn, our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Amen. Thank you. Church family, thank you so much for joining us today. It is such a wonderful thing to see so many of our people wanting to be here and to gather together. And I also want to say thank you to our parking team. Justin, your team's an awesome job. And to all of our musicians who are so faithful. Thank you all. All of us have a race that God has put before us this week. And so let's run it for his glory. Thank you for being here. And as you leave, once again, be nice to each other. God bless. <laughs> Yeah, please. Yep, 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 y